Hello, everyone, and welcome to 100 Plus and Medical Economics presentation on AI and remote patient monitoring together. My name is Dan Gasparini. I am the head of sales at 100 Plus. We'll be presenting today along with Mike Worm, our head of product. And we have a special guest, Nadia Hamad, who is a registered nurse and RPM coordinator at Greenville Healthcare Associates, one of our uh, current current practices that are that are live on our 100 plus remote patient monitoring program. Um, we will not be joined today by our head of medical, Mintu. Uh, unfortunately, he got pulled into uh, an emergency. Uh, but that being said, if you do have any questions for Mintu specifically or about the presentation, feel free to contact us by email at any time and we will get those questions answered for you. Moving on to the learning objectives for today, um, three, three main takeaways I'd like everybody to have today. Number one, we're gonna examine how patient outcomes can be improved using AI, and specifically AI-powered remote patient monitoring devices. Number two, we're gonna cover in detail uh, the revenue side of remote patient monitoring for your practices. We're gonna cover the RPM CPT codes, we're going to go through a mock pro forma for uh, just the typical practices that we see. And we can speak to the um, billing frequencies, say, of these different codes. Third, we're going to outline how to improve practitioner performance. Um, we have great data to share with you, great patient outcome data based on our uh, longitudinal study that we've ran internally, um, and as well as a lot of the population health initiatives that we're we're taking on here at 100 plus. So on to the uh, agenda, in the next slide uh, there, Mike. Um, we've covered this already, not to belabor the point, but we're covering the Medicare landscape with RPM. We're gonna talk about improving patient, improving patient outcomes with RPM. The really, really cool uh, cutting edge stuff we're doing with AI to promote patient adherence. Um, and then again, the, the economics and implementation of RPM. We'll end up with uh, Nadia covering her experience rolling out at her practice, and there will be a Q&A period uh, toward the end. So with that being said, Mike, you can take it away uh, going on into RPM and the Medicare landscape. Awesome, okay, cool. Um, so, uh, Folks, let me know uh, if you can't hear me. And uh, as you have questions, please uh, don't hesitate, uh, add them to the thread and uh, Dan will, will read them out and you know the, the right person will, will tackle it. And as Dan said, unfortunately, uh, Mintu isn't able to join, but um, he has offered that he would you know, uh, love to spend one-on-one uh, -on -one time with any of the folks who you know, are interested as, as uh, appropriate. Um, and so, you know, if there's questions that you feel like um, we, or we feel like we can't cover directly, um, let us know and we'll make sure that we get those answered for you. Um, so, you know, I wanna start with talking about some of the challenges that uh, the, some of the folks on the call experience on a daily basis with our healthcare system. So, you know, we're doing a lot of things right. We're putting our best foot forward. But of course, as with anything, there are continuing challenges. And you know that might be an understatement in uh, the, the world of healthcare. But I want to focus on a few today that we think can really be addressed by remote patient monitoring. So if you think about a uh, patient's journey, uh, today, uh, when they come in for uh, checkups on their chronic conditions, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, the big three, um, and, and a number of more other ones, uh, you know, we're we're getting snapshots of how their health is at that point in time, on that day, after that meal, you know, after that conversation, and so um, that that snapshot means that our assessment of the treatment plan that we have put them on is going to be incomplete. And, and it's just that, it's a snapshot. And so um, it's not the full picture. Further, you know, if, if we did have the full picture, uh, we would need to be adjusting the dials on their treatment plan you know, much more frequently. But we don't have those opportunities because again, the, you know, frequency of appointments that we have with patients about their chronic diseases 
are infrequent. Um, oftentimes, it's you know at, at most you know a couple times a year. Um, so the period uh, in between is measured in months. And the reason why we can't do that is very clear. Um, you know, our most scarce resource is clinician bandwidth, and it's you know something that's highly sought after by you know really everyone um, for good reason. And uh, you know that's the reason why we we just you know can't meet with patients more frequently. Um, and you know further, um, patients uh, if they are taking. Uh, care of themselves and measuring their biometrics at home to, you know, understand what's happening with their health, which, you know, isn't that all that common um, to actually have, uh, you know, great adherence with that. Um, you know, there's no return of information to the patient in, in a very intuitive and simple way. And of course, no feedback loop to the clinician on that data. So if they're, you know, buying a blood pressure cuff from CVS, um, you know, and, and taking their reading, you know, it'll tell them their reading. Um, and like, if they really understand modern technology and they can figure out the full funnel to get through an app and log in and figure out the right page in the app, then maybe they can get a little bit of return of information. Um, but that's a very small proportion that actually are fully in the loop on their own biometric journey. And let's say, you know, that small proportion does then bring in their data to uh, their clinician, which I'm sure, you know, a, a number of the folks on the call have experienced, then, you know, you're not getting discrete reimbursement for that remote care. You know, you're getting paid for that visit, but it's really a different type of care and, and review. And so that's why Medicare um, launched remote patient monitoring um, in uh, 2018. And, and providers are now very broadly using remote patient monitoring to monitor and assess patients' health status and symptoms with any red flags tri triggering, you know, automatic or, or uh, you know, programmatic interventions. It's powerful because it allows continuous or frequent monitoring of the patient. So really solving that problem that um, I highlighted just a minute ago. Um, and it provides the doctor with more information, high temporal resolution information, enabling them with a faster trigger to identify risk factors rather than waiting for the patient's next appointment um, or for them to experience, you know, what none of us want, um, a, an acute care episode. Um, and so this has been shown to significantly increase patient independence, um, and uh, reduce avoidable emergency department visits. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll get to, to the numbers uh, very quickly here, but uh, Medicare uh, started the reimbursement for this and, you know, all of the payers are following suit. And on, from in a fee-for-service context for a patient whose uh, reimbursement is, is going to be fee-for-service, uh, you you can have a revenue opportunity of about seven hundred dollars per patient per year. So you can do really well for yourself while doing good for your patients. Um, and of course, if you multiply that by your load of patients with chronic diseases, which um, in you know the Medicare uh, age group and cohort is over seventy percent have at least uh, one chronic condition then you really get to some, some material revenue numbers quite quickly. Um, so, so let's talk about that in more detail. Um, what are the codes? So there's four codes that providers use to bill Medicare and other payers for remote patient monitoring, RPM. Um, and the amount that providers are reimbursed, of course, varies based on where they are in the country and their zip code. Um, and so the values you, you see on the screen here our national averages. Um, the first code is 99453. And, uh, you know, you, you should really think of that as a one-time uh, reimbursement for uh, your time and clinician's time to set up remote patient monitoring services and educate the patient on, you know, why we're doing this together and uh, how exactly they uh, need to participate in their own uh, care. Um, 
Cool. So um, next we have 99454. This code is uh, reimbursement for the device supply of daily readings or programmed alerts to the patient to prompt them to take a reading. So it's an either or that you're getting reimbursed for. And so, you know, of course, I think one of the uh, first questions that uh, you're thinking of is how do we get patients to uh, utilize remote patient monitoring? It's always hard to get behavior change. We all know that. And um, I think one of the beautiful parts about how Medicare uh, kicked off this program is that they accounted for that and how they wrote the reimbursement for 99454, which is on a monthly basis and is, you know, a, a uh, about half of the potential revenue source um, for remote patient monitoring. And so because they've included the, you know, device supply with a daily reading or a programmed alert, they're accounting for the fact that, hey, you know, we, we aren't going to be able to get a patient to take a reading every day. And that's okay. No, of course, we want to continue improving how, uh, how uh, much data we get into the patient's chart so that we can have you know, those more frequent snapshots, right? Instead of it being every few months, we have it every few days. Um, and so that's really the intent behind how 99454 was written. Um, and Seema Verma, the uh, former head of the uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services is uh, a member of our board of advisors at 100 plus here. And so, you know, we've, we've talked to her at length about the origination of these and uh, it, it's really interesting. So let me know if you guys have any more questions on kind of the regulatory perspective. Um, 99457 is reimbursement for the clinician's time in reviewing the data, doing that awesome pattern matching um, that, that you're able to uniquely do um, draw out the insights uh, and what's clinically relevant and necessary to communicate to the patient about how to calibrate or uh, their care plan up or down and titrate medications. And then 99458 is additional reimbursement up to two more uh, sets of 20 minutes. Um, 99457 is reimbursement for 20 minutes. 99458 is up to uh, two more sets of that, um, so 40 or 60 minutes. Um, in, in a given month. Um, so the monthly codes are the two in the middle. And then uh, the last one is, you know, ad hoc as medically necessary. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, that's uh, the total monthly potential reimbursement per patient. Um, I'll pause there. Dan, is there anything you wanted to add here? Yeah, just um, just some, some, some color uh, from our network. So, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of practices active on this on this program. What we typically see is that nine nine four five four, right? That that that's billed monthly. Um, nine nine four five seven. You know, the idea is that you're spending at least twenty minutes of time on each patient per month, right? So that's vast vast majority of time billed monthly. And then nine nine four five eight. That's really for for patients that have multiple conditions or require that extra time, we see that build 35% of the time across our network. We're going to go into detail later in the presentation on like what a general pro forma would look like for like a primary care. So I don't want to get into too into it here, but just, just wanted to add that uh, for the group, for those of you wondering. And if you have any questions, you know, by all means, utilize the chat. Um, we're happy to pause and, and answer, you know, if you have a question, someone probably has the same questions. So don't feel bad about asking it. Um, but yeah, that's all, that's all I want to add there, Mike. Go for it. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, so I want to, you know, quickly cover um, the, the full picture here. So um, why does remote patient monitoring exist? Um, for patients, it's to improve their health outcomes. And this is, you know, the foundation, right? Um, and for practices, this is to encourage you um, and your clinicians and incentivize you to be able to spend more time to understand your patient's uh, kind of continuity of their healthcare journey in between visits and, you know, add revenue to your practice. And then as a technology provider, 100 plus is really focused on enabling the practices and 
and enabling them to scale their time. So they spend, you know, their uh, very scarce 20 minutes per patient per month. And we enable you to do a lot with that 20 minutes. Um, and so that's really what our mission is. Now let's talk about in more detail the benefits for patients. So um, I uh, want to talk you know, quickly about the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center's uh, study on decreasing hospital admissions. So they were able to decrease hospital admissions by uh, three-fourths or 76 percent and had over 90 percent patient satisfaction scores. Um, and as you can see in some of the other studies that we've seen here with Kaiser and the VA, there's very high patient satisfaction scores um, for remote patient monitoring because it gives the patient a sense that the clinician is you know, much more connected to their healthcare journey. And that's, that's true, right? It's um, you're, you know, again, going from infrequent snapshots to a continuous picture. Um, so getting into the data a little bit deeper, um, we, uh, you know, have, have some really interesting data uh, from uh, diabetic patients who, if they uh, uploaded one, uh, one reading per day, they lowered their HbA1cs uh, by uh, a significant amount compared to those who were uploading their uh, their reading less frequently. So we saw a direct correlation between reading frequency or upload frequency, which aren't always the same thing, um, and the improvement in uh, the, you know, in important biometric there. Um, now, turning to uh, some of our data um, for the 100 plus platform, 70% uh, of our providers believe that 100 plus is enabling them to fulfill the mission of remote patient monitoring, which is to reduce the incidence of hospitalization and other forms of high acuity care. Um, and if, when asked whether uh, patients uh, are able to in, improve their blood pressure control or hemoglobin A1C control um, for the relevant chronic conditions, um, you can see the proportion of providers that are saying that 100 plus enables them to do that. So you're seeing almost every provider on our platform say that they are able to uh, improve or gr greatly improve their ability, their own ability to help patients with blood pressure control in hypertension. So if your uh, you know, practice um, or system has a fair, fairly high patient load of patients with hypertension, and that has you know, significant impacts on those patients' uh, health outcomes and quality of life, and you know, the, the relevant at-risk bearing organizations with um, you know, the financial costs associated with the downstream impacts of hypertension, like 100 plus is really your best bet, um, as you can see here. And we're happy to put you in touch with additional providers. I'm super excited to have Nadia speak in a minute on her experience. Um, and so you can see, you know, we have similar um, conviction by our provider population for uh, our ability to help them improve uh, control for diabetics and, uh, and heart failure. And on weight loss with obese patients, it's still clinically meaningful, though less at 34% of providers um, who, you know, feel confident that 100 plus is able to improve their uh, control of, of weight loss for those obese patients. So then, you know, that, that was survey data, right? And that's pretty qualitative. Um, so one, wanted to get more quad, quantitative with it. So we looked at um, our entire patient population a few months ago, which at the time um, was uh, quite a bit less, but at uh, 14,000 patients across uh, 282 sites. And uh, really importantly, we had um, a uh, skew toward uh, the female population, which is oftentimes pretty hard to get in a study. Um, and so we were really excited to see that happening organically in our study. Um, and the age range is, as <laughs> as you would expect, from a program that was originally kicked off by Medicare, but, you know, of, of course, is now reimbursed broadly by commercial insurers as well. Um, 
so then, you know, from a geographic distribution perspective, it's, you know, really mirrors uh, population density. So nothing uh, super exciting here, um, but, you know, it's, it's important to, uh, to know. Um, and now for, for the fun stuff, uh, the results. So um, we found that for uh, hypertensive patients, I'll start at the bottom and move my way up um, because it's actually most exciting um, at the bottom. So hypertensive patients on average start at uh, day zero on our platform with their systolic blood pressure at 141 millimeters of mercury. You guys probably see that uh, you know, pretty consistently across your uh, patient bases as well. Um, and over the first 180 days on our platform, with a really large sample size and statistically significant p-value, we uh, see that those patients have blood pressure improvement for systolic blood pressure down to 136. Um, and this is a uh, significantly greater reduction than the comparable studies. Happy to send out the link. I know you guys can't access that right now. Um, and, you know, the, the cost savings potential here for any at-risk uh, organizations or as you think about, you know, building, uh, building out your, uh, you know, star scores or, um, or uh, uh, MIPS, um, is really significant. And so I think this can provide a lot of leverage in any conversations with at-risk organizations if you aren't one yourself. Um, and, and so, you know, this is obviously from a patient perspective, um, this, is, this is awesome. It's really, I mean, you're, you're uh, significantly in improving your blood pressure there. Um, and I'll, I'll put an asterisk that at this time, um, this is a correlative study, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to um, assert uh, that we are comprehensively causing the 4.7 millimeter of mercury reduction here. Um, but um, I think that it would be very surprising if a majority of the effect was not driven by RPM generally and 100 pluses um, kind of uh, flavor of RPM specifically, which I'm about to talk about um, in more detail. So, you know, why is it not causal? That's because we don't have a control group because, you know, we don't have the ethical capacity to build a control group because, you know, we are a te technology services company that's enabling practices. Um, and so over time, we're working with uh, Medicare Advantage providers and other at-risk organizations who have all the right data and the capacity to do a retrospective control group so that we can, you know, assert more causation with this, um, but wanted to calibrate everyone's um, uh, understanding of it a little bit there. Um, for diabetics, patients, random glucose dropped uh, seven and a half milligrams per deciliter over a uh, 180 day period. And obviously the cost saving potential for controlling uh, diabetes is massive. Um, you know, this is um, about uh, a quarter of, if, if you do the um, mapping uh, to uh, hemoglobin A1C, uh, this is about a quarter of a percentage point of hemoglobin a H1C, the, the mappings uh, uh, that I've used in the past. Um, and for patients with obesity who start over 286 pounds and averaging around 300 pounds in that uh, subset, they lost 7.8 pounds over the first 90 days. Um, and, you know, again, the cost savings potential for controlling obesity are massive. And all of the uh, values that I'm showing here are statistically significant. So um, I'll pause there. I can't see the thread, uh, Dan, but if you want to let me know if there's any questions on the outcomes data that we're seeing so far, um, otherwise I can move on to our AI. Yeah, no, uh, no questions on the outcomes data. There, there were a few questions regarding 99457 and 458 billing frequency that I answered just directly. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that again during the pro forma section. Um, okay. And then Nadia will also, um, you know, speak speak to the, her best practices for for logging time uh, that they that they do over at uh, Greenville Healthcare. But uh, no, no, no outcomes questions. Cool. Um, so now I want to talk about you know how how do we. Uh, actually attain those patient outcomes? And why is one, 100 plus the best partner for your practice and or system to enable you to achieve those outcomes and continue pushing the envelope and, and push for better outcomes? Um, so it really comes down to 
patient adherence. Um, and if we get patients to take their own health care um, in, into their own hands, then you know that psychological effect has cascading effects on you know their actual health. Obviously, the um, calories expended to take your reading isn't actually causing any of the uh, biometric improvement that we're seeing here. It's really a psychological effect um, that has those cascading impacts on what you're eating, how often you're exercising, and by the way, how often you're having a conversation with your clinician about all of those um, factors and, of course, titration of medication. Um, so how do we solve for patient adherence? I would bucket it into two primary categories. The first is making sure they can go zero to one. What I mean by that is that they don't get all messed up in the process of signing up and uh, getting started. So we make it as simple as possible, whereby um, here, here are the devices that uh, we deliver to patients and they're all cellular. Um, and I'll come back to that in, in a minute. But the way that this works is um, if, if you work with us, uh, you'll have access to a, a little web portal where you can sync your patients. And if they're eligible for RPM and you think it makes sense for them to have one or any number of these devices, our pricing doesn't change. Uh, send them as, as many devices as you believe necessary. Um, then uh, You'll enter their address or it'll just sync from your EMR and it will ship directly from our warehouses to their front door. So you don't have to manage any uh, inventory or logistics. And uh, when they get it, they take it out of the box like they do with any e-commerce order um, and take a reading. And the data automatically flows over the cellular networks into our web app and increasingly with more and more of our practices, back into their EHRs. Um, and it's as simple as that. The patient themselves has a what we call a zero-click setup, meaning they have no app to configure. They don't have to configure anything on the device. They just use the device. And these are devices that have been around for years. And you know, given their conditions, they probably used one before that isn't cellularly connected. So you know, we, um, we use AT&T, have national coverage, um, have uh, no coverage issues, and uh, we didn't want to use anything that, you know, connects over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi syncing because um, while a lot of seniors do have smartphones, even if they do have it, I mean, I get flummoxed with uh, pairing of Bluetooth devices all the time. It's confusing. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that patients weren't stuck at the beginning of our product uh, journey. And of course, if there's any issues with any of the devices, which like their hardware, you know, 0.2% of the time, they weren't put together right at the factory, we send out a new one, no questions asked, as quickly as possible. Batteries, glucose strips, all consumables are included in perpetuity. Um, and our customer support is based in the US across all of the time zones so that we can connect with the patient whenever they need help with their device, um, which doesn't happen that frequently, but it's very helpful that we have that capacity. So that's um, the first bucket. The second bucket is, you know, after they've gotten set up, making sure that they're taking readings as frequently as possible. And so um, I, I use a model of uh, behavior modification, um, and, and there's a bunch out there, but the one that I um, have spent most time with is the FOG model from from the Stanford Design School, which uh, summarizes it as uh, behavior uh, equals motivation times ability times trigger, or you know, motivation with the ability with a trigger. Um, and so, patients, in order to have the behavior we want, to take a reading so that we can, you know, uh, administer preventative care based on that reading, they need motivation, they need the ability, and a trigger. They all have the ability. So that one is simple and we've made it easy with um, not having to figure out how to connect it with a smartphone or do any configuration. Zero click setup means they have the ability. Um, and 
Uh, and the only time they don't have the ability is when the batteries die, they'll die eventually. Um, and we actually know when the batteries are about to die and are automatically sending new batteries um, and they all know how to put in new batteries. So they have the ability. So then we have to figure out, okay, we need them to continue to stay motivated and we need them to have a contextual trigger for when they need to take a read. And so uh, those are the two things that we've solved for with our artificial intelligence. So um, it sounds fancy, but the instantiation of it is actually very, very simple because it comes through um, as SMS. So um, Ava is our AI-based virtual medical assistant. And Ava is able to uh, understand what patients text to, uh, to her and respond intelligently. And then Ava improves the patient journey across every step of the life cycle. So at the beginning of the patient journey, uh, for example, uh, patients need to consent to the medical service as they do um, with all of the services at your, your practice. Um, and we enable your practice to do that um, as stipulated by the CPT code guidelines. Um, we enable patients to consent to the services over SMS. Um, and we also start to educate the patient on RPM. And so again, we're trying to scale the time that you uh, uh, give to your RPM program. The initial 20 minutes of setup, we scale that by doing a lot of automated patient education. So that conversation is already going smoothly when you start it. Um, so we'll do patient education, uh, you, uh, patient consent um, solicitation, and uh, we've seen this accelerate and maximize patient acceptance of your new RPM program by over 2x. So, you know, it's, it's much more effective than just having human-based conversations because they're, they are given materials that they can consume on their own time, and everyone kind of digests that at their own pace. Then, of course, you know, we do shipment notifications uh, with Ava. She is uh, plugged into our uh, US uh, UPS instance and, you know, does kind of standard e-commerce tracking uh, activities. You guys have all seen this, so I won't bore you with the details there. Um, but, you know, what's critical is that um, we have the contextual trigger from shipment tracking when it arrives on their front doorstep. So as soon as it does, um, you know, assuming it's the appropriate time of day and it's, you know, on, on uh, waking hours when you get your package um, as a patient, we'll, uh, Ava will text the patient and say, you know, get them excited about the devices being there. Send a video that shows them how to, uh, you know, unbox the package. It's pretty straightforward, but just in case anyone had um, any, any concerns, we'll help patients with that. Um, and um, answer any questions that they have. And so, you know, we've gotten tons of questions from patients and they have, you know, they're, they're smart and they are asking questions about the program. And so we have classified all of those different questions and have uh, responses coming from Ava to answer those questions. And so that means fewer questions that go to your practice about, you know, when is it going to get here? And, you know, how do I do this thing? And am, am I going to get glucose strips automatically? Or do I have to ask for those? And, you know, all the questions that um, you could be asked, Ava is asked because she is creating this relationship with the patient. And we use SMS, by the way, because all patients have SMS or, you know, more specifically, it's not all patients. 92% of patients have a smartphone that 92% uh, of patients over 65. So if you go under 65, it's even higher, but 92% um, have an SMS enabled phone. About two thirds of those are smartphones and uh, a third are feature phones. Um, and so again, SMS just works. They don't have to download an app so that they can talk to Ava or get any of this uh, setup help. Um, they just text as they normally do, uh, text their grandkids. Um, and then most importantly, um, after we, you know, help the patient uh, get set up with the zero click setup, um, we um, have Ava text the patient when they take a reading, we give positive reinforcement. When they haven't taken a reading for a few days and they've fallen out of adherence, then uh, she will give the patient both the trigger 
for uh, encouraging that behavior and the motivation. So if it's you know the first time that they have fallen out of adherence, you know she'll do a quick friendly reminder, and we're starting to play around with um, some more interesting ways to keep them engaged. Um, but if you know they've continued to be non-adherent for a few days, which will happen, then you know she she will shift her tone um, to increase their motivation and really explain to them why it's important that they take their healthcare into their own hands. Um, and and so you know we've seen uh, Ava increase patient adherence by you know as you can see uh, over thirty six percent across all of our practices. And this this uh, stat is actually a few months old. I I think we've updated that now, and it's significantly higher now um, because we're you know always making updates to how we implement uh, implement Ava. Um, and so, if you guys have any questions about you know Ava specifically and you know how the AI works, any of that, uh, let me know. Again, you know I I'm uh, not able to see the the chat thread, yeah, but Michael, Dan, I'll yeah. uh, I'll I'll narrate a few to you. There's a couple that came in. Um, cool. First off. Uh, What's the roadmap for languages with Ava? Yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, localization of Ava is something that they're, you know, we're using Amazon Web Services in, in the background here for a, a lot of the uh, natural language processing. And so out of the box, um, they enable us to pretty quickly turn on. Um, I believe it's uh, Spanish and a number of the other Romance languages. Um, and so I think there's probably eight or 10 that, you know, if your practice has a really high concentration of a specific language, um, and, you know, we could go uh, cross-reference uh, what we have available that we could go turn on. I think there's about eight or 10, though, that would be, you know, matter of weeks. Um, and then... You know, for the other languages, it's probably realistically further off. But I think that's um, worth following up about directly. Um, and you can email uh, Dan at uh, Dan at 100 plus or myself at Mike at 100 plus. Um, so pretty straightforward uh, with that one. But but just to be clear, today Ava is only in English. Um, but we we've you know uh, talked about you know when we have the right trigger for us, um, we we will be increasing those languages. Thanks. Um, and then just a clarification question regarding monthly billable time. Um, I, I mean, I can answer this one. Ava does not contribute to the monthly billable time. That, that is actually um, a person at your practice that can be a medical assistant, a nurse, a doctor. U usually um, practice will have a, a doctor oversee the program. Um, and then, but the majority of the um, time is actually being done by uh, medical assistants. That's usually what we'll see. Um, yeah, and, and I'll just add on to that. Care. I mean, uh, the you know the CPT code uh, guideline is uh, the uh, twenty minutes of a clinician, um, and so Ava is not a clinician, um, so she does not directly contribute to that. But um, clearly, she enables you to scale um, what you could accomplish with a patient in twenty minutes of a clinician's time. Um, and so, like, if you th thought about, like, um, you know, equivalent minutes or something, like, it's pretty significant um, because she is texting back and forth with patients all the time. And, of course, you know, you can uh, go ahead and, and look at the thread history with Ava, um, at, you know, as, as you find it relevant. Um, and in the future, you know, we're playing around with the idea of enabling clinicians to take over the text message uh, uh, thread and, and compo composing and sending. And of course, that would constitute, um, you know, clinician time toward the CPT code for those fee-for-service patients. Um, but um, yeah, and I guess, you know, it's also relevant to mention as we talk about clinician time with remote patient monitoring, it's, it's really any interaction um, or, uh, you know, analysis or insight generation that you have about um, a patient's uh, condition status while they're not in at an appointment. And so um, we've uh, spoken to a lot of practices where they're really recapturing time that isn't billable today. So for example, if um, you, know, you uh, decide that because of an escalation in blood pressure readings, uh, you think that um, the patient should come in for an appointment and 
you know, uh, talk about something. Um, the time that it takes to schedule that next appointment, that counts toward your 99457 20 minutes or 99458 if you're already 20 minutes. Um, so, you know, we, we've seen uh, clinicians be and, and practices be really, really satisfied with the ability to recapture that time in coordination with the patient um, and with, you know, the other clinicians at your practice about that patient. Thanks, Mike. Um, do you want to give guidance on 994? There's a question on 99454 um, regarding the current rule of 16 minimum transmissions per CMS or two during the uh, public health emergency. Do you want to speak to that a little bit regarding what qualifies for billing 454? Yeah, absolutely. So during the population health emergency, um, I, I'll just back up for context because the uh, person who's asking the question is, you know, deeply informed on it, but, um, you know, I wouldn't expect everyone to uh, know all of it uh, yet. So, um, the 99454 CPT code states uh, that you need uh, 16 days of device supply with a reading or a programmed alert transmission. So, uh, you know, about half the days in the month, you either need to be reminding the patient to take a reading and or actually getting a reading itself. Um, and that's what the... CPT code was written as in 2019 when that one came out. Um, and then during the uh, COVID-19 population health emergency, um, for a number of reasons, they dropped that threshold of 16 days down to two days. Um, I can't say that I really understand the impetus for that, um, but uh, you know, it, it's a transient change. And so we have not, uh, we, when we speak to clinicians and, and yourself, um, we, we don't really focus on the two days of readings or alerts because eventually the, you know, population health emergency, um, you know, is going to end. Um, and, uh, and in that, you know, future world, it'll be back to 16 days of readings. There have been, there's been a lot of feedback to CMS asking why is it 16 days and is that the right threshold? Should it be lower? We're starting to get a lot of data that shows um, you actually get patient outcomes like the ones that I mentioned earlier at much lower uh, levels of actual readings um, and alerts. So, you know, I think there, it, it's still a degree of freedom in the future. Um, but all that said, um, you know, what we guide clinicians on is let's go get 16 days of readings or sending patients alerts. Um, and with Ava, that's clearly like a very easy, uh, bar to cross, right? Um, so if you have a patient, um, who, takes five readings um, on five different days because they're deduped on a daily basis, then uh, you uh, have Ava sending alerts on 11 other days, then you've hit that 16-day threshold. Now, again, during the PHE, the 16-day threshold is down to two. And so, you know, anyone over two uh, days of readings or alerts would be reimbursable. Um, but, it, and, and that's, you know, important, uh, given that's the kind of current, uh, statute in, in the land. Um, but again, we focus our, our mission on, you know, increasing adherence to a level that satisfies the original rule. Um, and, and we're also, you know, as I said, we're feeding data back to CMS on, um, what the right threshold is, because in, as I mentioned, you know, we spoke to SEMA um, and, and uh, I, I don't know how broadly I was supposed to share this, but like the 16 day threshold didn't come from a lot of data. Um, it was kind of based on intuition. And so now that we have data to support, you know, what actually drives patient outcomes, I think that degree of freedom will change at some point, but um, not, not quite yet. I probably over answered that question, but uh, let me know if if there's any uh, remaining uncertainty. No, that's good context. That's good context. Um, that That's it um, for the cool. questions. Um, I, th there's one more in here, but I'm going to kind of cover it during my part. Um, I think it'll be helpful really quickly uh, just to go over what an implementation of uh, an RPM program looks like, 
right? Like start to finish, what does that look like at your practice? So I'm going to cover that now, try and get through in, in, in five or 10 minutes here, as well as the um, ROI calculator for uh, an RPM practice. And then we'll have uh, Nadia finish up with her best practices and roll out an experience. And I know you all want to hear from her more than me. So I'll, I'll go quickly. I'll go quickly uh, on my part. Um, so first things first, the provider will have to sign up for the program. We will build you a portal. It takes five minutes and we get you logged in and familiarized with the portal. Um, step two is we enroll your patients. So we will have an EHR expert work with you to run a patient extraction from your system. We will then upload that patient list to our portal, at which point we will run a complete eligibility check. So practices love that we do this. It takes a lot of time to call all those insurances, as I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with. We have an internal algorithm where we'll do that for you. So when, when you're evaluating an RPM program, right, it's important that you have a true count of your eligible patients so that you can project costs and revenues associated with that, right? So this is part of an evaluation process that we do with practices. Um, if you would like a complimentary patient eligibility check completed for you, we will do that for you at no charge. Uh, just put your zip code in the, uh, in the chat or the question. I'm happy to have somebody on my team reach out to you and uh, run this entire process for you. But so now we have the patients uploaded into the portal and say there's a thousand patients you have that are eligible at your practice for this. They need to consent to be on the program. The, so the patients need to be informed of the program and, and give their either verbal consent or they can consent uh, by responding to AVA or they can fill out a paper contract and consent that way. But either way, this is a, a major step, right, in, in rolling out a program. And this is something that we do very well here. We have a team, uh, U.S. domestic team. Uh, many of them are nurses. And they will reach out to your patient base and have the conversation and spend the time and you know, really work to educate the patient on the value uh, of this program, right? Get their buy-in. Um, so again, this is something that our team, our team handles for you. We, we like to think that we have a very uh, seamless implementation process here. This, this process, we usually will have about 70% of eligible patients uh, consent uh, for the program of, of the total eligible out of practice. And from there, we ship them devices directly to their homes, right? The, those devices ship in about a week. Patients will then use those devices, as, as Mike explained, it is very simple to use. Uh, you know, blood pressure cuff, for example, I mean, it has one button on it. I mean, you can't, <laughs> it cannot be easier to use. And there's no setup. It's already paired to the patient. They'll get their readings. It'll display for them. And the readings will also make their way to the portal from there. The providers will then use that portal, right? They will, they will log in. They will spend their time, uh, usually in five-minute increments, uh, to, to, uh, to provide care, right? To assess what's needed to be done with these patients, keep an eye on them, reach out to the patients. If, if anything is awry, uh, these providers will also be given uh, automatic alerts if patients test out of uh, an ADA or AHA safe range. Um, for, uh, obviously those are, are preloaded into the, into the system. And we actually have on the roadmap that those will be editable, uh, at some point, uh, for, for your practice, you can choose your own ranges, but from there, uh, it's, it's a, it's a Medicare, uh, billing time, right? You, so you have, you know, if you rolled this out to your practice today, patients would have their devices by the end of the month, their first complete billable month would be. November, you would submit those uh, claims to Medicare at the end of November, um, and they would be reimbursed usually around the middle of December. And, and it's just it's just that it's just that simple. Our, our our fee is due after that reimbursement comes through, so we give a net sixty invoice <clears throat> on the first uh, on the first payment cycle, and then that payment is due. Ideally, this is a flow through cost. Um, as far as rolling out to your practice, we have no upfront fees of any kind. Uh, we will furnish as many devices as required uh, for your patients. 
Um, but that's, you know, that's a discussion for another day. And if you'd like to have that discussion, again, just put your zip code in the chat. Happy to have somebody reach out to you to, to do that. Um, Mike, can we move on to the uh, ROI uh, slide? There you go. Um, one more back. There it is. So, so this is what generally costs would look like for a practice. Um, we'll do this for your practice specifically, if you'd like. Uh, and as Mike had covered, I'm, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on what the codes are. We, we've covered that at length. But the idea, right, is that this should be a substantial revenue plugin, right, for, for your practice. Um, we bill, the, the assumptions built into this pro forma are that 99457 is billed monthly, 99458 is billed 35% of the time, right, which is our, our network average. And you can see that even in backing out labor costs at the practice, it, it, it nets out to between four and five hundred thousand dollars for a practice with six hundred and fifty patients live on the program. So again, not not to not to make this all uh, about the revenue exclusively, right? Like this is about outcomes. This is about helping patients. But Medicare aggressively incentivizes this because it works. It works to save Medicare money. It works to save the practice or make the practice money. And it works to uh, promote better patient health, right? And that's, that's you know, it, it's, it's always nice when it's, it's a win, 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 right, all around. So we can spend time on billing and reimbursement, but um, I'm going to skip through this in the essence of time and yield the floor to Nadia Hamad, uh, Greenville Healthcare Associates. Um, Nadia, if you could speak maybe to your uh, ongoing experience and your general experience with rolling out and some best practices, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you guys for having me. Again, my name is Nadia. I am a nurse um, and RPM coordinator at Greenville Healthcare Associates. Basically, um, we uh, started RPM at the beginning of the pandemic, so back April of 2020. It kind of fell into my lap. I was posed with a question of, um, you know, in a world where we don't know what's going on, everybody was stuck in their homes, everybody is telehealth, how do we, for one, continue to stay open um, and make sure people have jobs? And most importantly, how do we give medical care when patients are not coming into the office? Started doing some research at that point. Um, RPM was kind of a thing. Met with several different companies, probably eight or nine of them. Um, and 100 plus just fit our office perfectly. I think that um, like Dan had already said, you know, onboarding is really great. It's very simple. There are no upfront costs, which is great in a time where you physically are not seeing patients in your office and you're depending on telehealth, you know, to help you uh, stay open. So that was one of the great things. Another thing for our office, um, we're in a very rural area in Texas. We have a very big um Medicare population. A lot of our patients are elderly. A lot of them have been patients here for a very long time. And so having something that's easy for them to use, you know, it comes, you put the batteries in and you don't have to worry about a thing was very important for us. And that's worked well for our office. Um, Aside from, you know, getting into why the devices are great and those kind of things, I think more of what you guys want from me today is just implementation. And I think that's the most important thing when looking at an RPM program. How are you implementing it in your office for what makes sense for you? I know a lot of offices that I've spoken to, um, a lot of people in 100 plus, they have offices where your medical assistants or your nursing staff are kind of taking over this and hours that doesn't work well for us. Um, it's between me and our providers, and um, we have seven of them. We have five that are responsible for RPM, and this is something that they check daily. So between them and I, we get it done. We have almost 500 patients on our um, uh, that are active right now, growing every day, hopefully, and, and I hope that it continues to. 
but um, a few of the questions that I saw in here that I thought I thought one was really great. And it says, how do you handle the large volume of alerts that patients may trigger? It seems like a really big work effort to the provider to monitor the daily vitals. Um, one of the things that we have in our office, we actually have already changed the um, parameters for when we get those alerts. Those alerts come to our providers via um, email. And so regardless of if they're in the office or at home, working from home, it's over the weekend, whatever the case may be, they're able to see those alerts. Um, like I said, we have those changed, so we have our own parameters. And I don't know that they find it difficult. You know, you get an alert, this patient, you know, their blood pressure is elevated. And, you know, you pull it up on your phone and you can look at it. If it's something that, you know, is that you're not very worried about right now, then, you know, you leave it until the next day. If not, then you call the patient and you follow up with them. That's just how we work. We're an office that's, you know, open normal business hours, but we also have on-call providers 24 seven. Another question that I saw earlier that I kind of wanted to hit on, um, as far as the billing codes, so the 99454s, 99457s, we treat that in our office kind of like we do our chronic care program. So anything that we do for you that is non-face-to-face -face is billable. So logging into your EMR to look at a patient's chart because you've been looking at their, you know, RPM um, results. If you're going to go in and check what medications they're on, if you want to see what their labs were the last time they were here, if you want to see what their blood pressure was the last time they were here, all of that is billable. Um, anything that you're doing, you know, if you are a clinician and you're speaking to your nurse about this patient, that's billable. Your nurse reaching out, your MA reaching out, anything that is done that is non-face-to-face -face is billable. Um, and the way that we do that is in the portal, there is a section where you can make notes and our providers go in and make notes each time they check these patients charts or anything that they do for the patient. Um, so, you know, and then they just note on there how long they took at the end of the month. We, we add all that together and we bill out what we need to bill out. It's a very simple process if you implement it correctly in your office. Um, to piggyback kind of on Mike earlier was speaking about um, why RPM is important. I think that it just creates a more conclusive picture of a patient's condition for you. You know, when you see patients every couple of months, um, they can come in, blood pressure might be a little bit elevated, maybe A1C is okay. You know, a lot of patients are not going to tell you the things that are going on outside of the office visit. A lot of patients are scared to start looking for things. You start looking, you start finding. And so you're just you're, you're just, you have a more conclusive picture of what's going on with that patient outside of the office. Also, I think that RPM is great because it's giving patients tangible um, things to look at in regards to their health care. You know, you're giving them an opportunity to be active in the care that they receive. Um, and to visualize their trends that are happening. When you log into the portal, you actually will have all of your data um, kind of laid out for you. And you also have graphs that make your trends vis visible. One of the things that we do here in our office is anytime a patient comes in for an appointment and they are on the RPM, that's pulled up in the office. Um, and the provider speaks to them about it. You know, let me show you what I see on my end. Let me show you your trends so that the you are understanding why, you know, you're on these medications, why these changes are being made, why this medical, um, um, you know, why you're receiving the care that you, that you care, or the, sorry, that you are receiving. It makes patients more compliant and involved in their care. And when you do that, you have much better outcomes. Um, there's another question that just came in. How did you reach out to patients to make them aware of RPM? Did you proactively email or text them? Do you introduce them to RPM at office visits, both or other? Which method was most successful? That's a very good question. Um, one of the things that I do in our office, um, aside from RPM, is I am in charge of um, our ACO compliance and star ratings for insurance. And if any of you guys are in family medicine, you know that medicine is really moving towards a preventative um, 
outlook. You know, everything is about prevention. So aside from RPM, I actually, for all seven of our providers, I prep our charts um, the day before patients are seen. And so I go in and look at all of the preventative measures that maybe they're missing, lacking, that need to be done. I also look and see if they qualify for our RPM um, based on insurance and diagnosis codes. Once I do that, I actually um, send that to our biller. And again, this is the, one of the things that works for us. This is something that, that 100 plus has in place that they'll do these things for you. For our patient load, they, they want everything done in-house. And the more that you do here, the more compliant they're going to be. So we take on that role. Um, I send it to the biller. Biller will let me know how it's covered. I note that in the chart, the provider talks to them about it when they're here. Um, and we go from there. If they you know, want to do it, then we get them signed up right then. And, and we, that's, that's how we proceed with that. Um, I don't see, is COVID included in patient monitoring program? Um, so one of the things that I have um, noticed with, I think one of the things when people are thinking about RPM and an RPM program, you're looking at basically diabetics, um, patients who are diagnosed with hypertension and people that are diagnosed you know, as obese. But I've found that there's so many other things that you can you can do. Medicare has a weight loss program. Um, and so that's, again, obesity is one of those things that you would look at. But patients with chronic kidney disease, patients with hyperlipidemia, patients with a history of, of CVAs, there's so many diagnosis codes that, that Medicare will accept because, you know, based on these codes, you have a plan in place to, yes, we need to watch your blood pressure. We need you to lose weight. We need an exercise program. Um, COVID is one of those. I have used COVID quite a bit um, in regards to blood pressure cuffs um, because it has, you know, indications to that where there are indications that, you know, it can have chronic um, cardiac problems. We are, um, I do know that we are still waiting on the thermometers and the O2 stats. And I've been told hopefully the beginning of next year, those will be out. And so that's another resource that you can add to your to taking care of your COVID patients. Um, yeah, I want to add uh, uh, one more uh, answer to a question that um, I heard on uh, the timer and time tracking being a, man being a manual process. Um, you know, uh, today in our uh, portal, this is um, reasonably simple. Um, but uh, in the next few weeks, we're launching some major improvements to this to enable um, more automated time tracking and uh, cumulative uh, totals and um, across different providers. So, you know, I, I just want to uh, make sure that um, whoever, you know, is, is asking that question, why don't we uh, get you set up with a, a demo so that we can really dig into what your concern is for the workflows that you've seen. And then I can just show you, you know, what, what the workflow could look like. Um, and of course, you know, any feedback that you have on how the software works today um, helps us um, adjust it so that it can work better for you tomorrow. So um, yeah, ho hopefully that answers your question. And again, I'm Mike at 100 plus.com. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, one, one, one last question I'll answer. I think we're running a bit long here, so we should wrap pretty shortly after this. Uh, regarding in the implementation phase, reaching out to patients, how do we, how do we engage them to gather their consent? So we have uh, our best practices that we find work very well. Um, we will send a hard copy mailer to each of the patients. Once those mailers start to land, um, we will begin our patient outreach and that will occur by phone and also by SMS through AVA. So, you know, really proud of our consent rates. Um, and I think a big part of that is we don't have, so like we don't have like salespeople making these consent calls, right? These are nurses largely, um, people there to help and have a half hour, 45 minute conversation if that's what's required. Um, so, you know, we, we feel that it's a very effective process and, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's all branded to the practice, right? So that, that goes a long way in, um, in promoting trust, right? From those patients. But 
I think, you know, being that we're at time, that, that's a good, that's a good place to end. Um, again, big thank you from everyone here at hundred plus and medical economics for, for spending an hour with us today. If you have any additional questions, um, you know, feel free to email Mike at hundred plus or email Dan period Gasparini at hundred plus. Good luck spelling that. Mike's probably a better bet, but, uh, again, thank you all for your time and, uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for your time. Cheers, everyone. Bye.